Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on our first Talent Table webinar. Uh, my name is Rebecca Warren, and I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first, and then we'll introduce our guests uh, and uh, get this party started. So if you look towards the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see some widgets that you can use during the event. Uh, there's also further related reading in the resources section. Uh, you can ask us questions using the Q&A. Uh, we've got a lot to go through today, so hopefully we'll get to the questions. But if we don't, uh, we will follow up uh, with those after the, the webinar. Uh, we in-person Cultivate events coming up in London and San Francisco. Uh, Jason and I will be in San Fran, so we'd love it if you would come and see us. Uh, and then you can find out more by clicking the button to uh, the left of the console. So what I would love to do to get us started was uh, will be to uh, have our uh, panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Anthony, can I start with you and have you do a little introduction? Of course, Rebecca. Yes, yeah, great to be on the, the session today. I'm Anthony Shields. I'm a partner in EY based here in London. Um, I have spent the last seven years running our digital talent function in EY, implementing our skills, strategy, and platform. And I'm currently uh, helping organizations globally around uh, this transition to uh, skills-based organizations. It's great to be on the call today. All right, Jason, can we send it on over to you for you to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, so happy to be here uh, and it's wonderful to join Anthony um, on this on this panel. Um, my name is Jason Serrato. I'm the Vice President of Market Strategy for Eightfold. Um, I've been with Eightfold now for a little over two and a half years. Um, I've been involved with Eightfold going back to 2018. Um, I, was, uh, I was an analyst in the industry covering uh, the explosion of AI in the talent space, um, which is when I was first introduced to Eightfold. Um, so I've been in this space for quite some time. Prior to that, I was a practitioner leading talent acquisition for a global Fortune 50. Um, also had a short stint uh, as an Eightfold customer. Um, so I love conversations like this, talking about talent, talking about technology, and especially in current times, talking about transformation. Um, had a chance to uh, participate in some of the previous conversations um, with Anthony um, and hopefully Gail's able to join us. I know right now he's going through some technical difficulties, but I've also read up on some of the things that Gail's doing at Forvia. Um, so both of these individuals are leading transformation um, in their organizations. So I'm um, really excited for the conversation today. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you everyone for, for joining us as sessions like this are really helpful. Um, and just learning from each other and, and listening and sharing some ideas um, as we as we kind of think bigger uh, and head towards the future of work. Absolutely. All right, I'll introduce myself. Like uh, like Jason said, hopefully you will be able to join those darn technical difficulties. Um, Rebecca Warren, so I have been with Eightfold for a little over three years now. Uh, I am in the customer success area, uh, was a practitioner previously as well. So Jason and I have that in common uh, and led uh, TA organizations um, uh, in several large restaurant retail and um, uh, uh, CPG organizations. So um, excited to be here and to work with us all here. So my role now is in customer success uh, and I help our customers uh, get all, all the things that they need and, and want out of the platform. So let's, uh, let's set the stage here a little bit. Uh, we're talking about the HR skill evolution, which is kind of an interesting uh, word. Uh, the, the skills revolution, whatever, we, however we want to say that, is now shifting to a skills-based approach for uh, recruitment and talent management. So focusing more um, on 
specific skills, strengths, and potential rather than traditional job descriptions, which look for specific work history, job titles, degrees, all of that. So we know now that focusing on skills allows for better alignment and agility between candidates, employees, and organizations, but it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and there's a lot of moving parts in order to make it effective. You know, some things to consider are evaluating your current processes, identifying gaps, assessing your workforce, selecting tools and technologies that will assist you in transition and measure success, creating change management plans, uh, fostering cultures of continuous learning and development as organizations think about not only jobs for today, but the roles of the future. So all that being said, let's back up a bit. Um, Anthony, I'm gonna flip this to you. What do you think is driving the shift from being job-centric to skill-centric? Uh, thanks, Rebecca. And I think it's a, it's a great question because I think that that um, position has evolved actually over the last two to three years. Um, from an EY perspective, we've been on this journey for now three years, transforming um, and shifting to being a skills-based organization. We're not there yet. And um, uh, in fact, most organizations are, are obviously not there yet. Um, I think, you know, most organizations, including ourselves, started with this shift because our current uh, organizational structures, our um, uh, job profiles, were not were just so sticky that they didn't enable us to, to be able to drive for us a better focus around our people around particularly careers and a lot of organizations um, have been focused on that shift to skills to be able to drive a much more 360 degree perspective on how you get better better careers um, but what's shifted i think in the last couple of years and particularly now working alongside our clients is the drivers have shifted to much more, I would say, strategic drivers around uh, in line with actually the market. So how do you use skills by identifying skills, getting the right skills in the right place at the right time to drive growth, to drive cost reduction, and to drive a better experience simultaneously? So what we're finding is that organizations currently uh, and a lot of our clients are, for example, driving uh, towards being a skills-based organization to get that agility to, for example, restructure, to ensure that their costs are, are managed effectively. How do you do that unless you've got visibility of skills, unless you've got an ability to be able to get those skills in the right place? Um, and, you know, a lot of organizations are going through acquisitions at the moment. Uh, you mentioned CPG. Similarly, we've got clients in the CPG sector who are really investing in this space so that they can get the value out of those acquisitions really fast. You know, a lot of organizations are shifting their businesses, and that means they have to understand what skills they've got, what skills they're going to need much more rapidly, and make decisions about whether that's an internal skill set they need, whether they need to recruit and buy, or whether they use contingent, or indeed, just get the right mix in terms of those shifts. But you're right, I think one of the things that I think is critical here and we found on our journey, which has been very challenging, and I think a lot of organizations are struggling with it, is you know, how do you get the right strategy to be able to um, make that shift and make that shift successfully? And adoption, as you mentioned, is a real issue. And I think it's this comes from two shifts the newness around the artificial intelligence, which often is the enabler for this shift, and the newness around shifting from those kind of formal traditional HR structures to a much more agile skills-based approach. And that means organizations um, have had challenging adoption. For example, in EY, we had 15% adoption in our rollout initially for the first 50,000 EYs. My head was on the line with that, uh, obviously, owning the platform and owning, owning the new process. Um, we've shifted to 80% um, adoption, and I know organizations that are successful in this area are really addressing that strategy around adoption. And I could talk all day about this, but really that strategy has to be human-centric, has to be human-focused. And it has to do three things really well in our experience. 
and that's through learning. You have to get that data right, that skills data right for your people. Otherwise, you, you don't get the supply side in the talent marketplace or indeed on any area of your, um, of your focus around skills. You have to think about not just the experience, but giving your people control if you're talking about internal marketplaces, for example. And you have to also think very carefully about changing your change approach. We used a very, uh, mm -hmm. I would say, traditional consulting change approach, as you might imagine in EY, and that just didn't work. So you know, there's a number of things that have to change in that approach. Um, and, and the mo main one, I would say, is that really seeing the shift that you're making around that new process, that new way of working, that new cultural change and system being the start of the process, not the end, and getting a really close relationship with your business around influencers. These have been some of the big things that we've been using internally and with our clients to address some of the adoption challenges we had. Yeah, the adoption challenges are, are um, I think, you know, consistent across all organizations. There's always a challenge to get folks to try something new, do something different. Um, I'm going to tack one more question onto that, and then Jason, I have a question for you um, around AI. Um, but Anthony, where, if if you were to give your um, your perspective is the right place to start to make this shift? Is it to do it with your employees and help drive that change? Or is it to um, start it on the front end when you're thinking about um, candidate attraction? Where do you think is the easiest place to start? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, Rebecca, because quite simply, organizations, including our own, don't have a really pragmatic strategy and roadmap around skills and therefore haven't looked at where the value is in the right way. And you know, each organization will be different in terms of how it prioritizes its roadmap, where it starts. For EY, we started absolutely in the talent marketplace area and we're shifting onto recruitment, workforce planning, resourcing, mobility, et cetera. But for other organizations, they, they will find, and a lot of our clients find, that recruitment is the right place to, to start. Irrespective, you need to have a really pragmatic roadmap for so many reasons. Number one, you will find that you will get a disjointed experience with skill strategies everywhere across the HR function and indeed actually out in the business. And that was beginning to be our experience in EY before we um, effectively put in our next wave career strategy two and a, two and a bit years ago. Um, secondly, you have to concentrate on experience. It's not an either or, or an a, it's an and. You, you can look at your cost reduction, productivity, agility needs at the same time as driving an experience. And particularly if you're starting out with um, talent marketplace, our experience is it's the only way that you actually get the value out of that platform. Because obviously, unless you've got a really compelling experience and one where the employees are in control of that experience, you then don't get that supply side actually right. You don't get the data right, et cetera, because you haven't got that adoption um, at the beginning. So that would be my strong recommendation, but it is an area where we are finding a lot of clients don't have a joined up strategy or roadmap in this area, which is, um, you know, Unsurprising in some ways, we were the same, but is you know a necessary, I think, foundation for most organizations. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that. So along with those changes, and you mentioned this um, when we talked about tech very briefly, um, is that a lot of these changes are being driven by technology, specifically by AI. So Jason, how do you look at the role of AI in empowering this skills-based change? I think there, there's a couple use cases and capabilities that are driving this as a result. So one is the ability to dynamically look at unstructured data quickly in real time. 
um, and the, the computing power of AI capability um, in driving this understanding of what's happening in your organization, gathering data from a variety of disparate sources is what's helping organizations kind of get their arms around making sense of what's happening, not only in their organization, but potentially in their industry, in their talent network, um, amongst their employees, applicants, candidates, um, a variety of different audiences. Um, and when I was an analyst, I worked with a colleague of mine, her name was Helen Potevan, and she phrased this as learning to use AI to embrace the chaos and using the technology to help make sense of what's happening around you in real time to some degree of confidence. And as you start to look at what the AI is surfacing and generating some degree of understanding, it starts to turn, it turn into this concept of talent intelligence. And as you get more comfortable with it, you can start to use it to formulate an understanding of uh, the capability of predicting what's gonna happen tomorrow. These emerging skills, these adjacencies, these capabilities for what is happening with how work is getting done versus how work was done yesterday. So I think that's a key element of the role of AI in empowering this kind of skills-based change. I think the other thing is when we've talked about kind of how this had been done in the past, a lot of it was done on job descriptions and work history. If you think about it, um, that was always lagging data. And with the pace of change and especially disruption with the way people are getting their job done and the tools they're using to get their job done, that lag is getting broader and wider, right? So if you're using AI to actually examine how they're getting their work done today, and part of it is they're, they're getting their work done by using AI as a tool, you're starting to understand how the work is getting done, which is increasingly different from how we've um, historically captured how it was done in the past. So this is what's helping also empower this skills-based change. And we're using this to understand talent through a deeper lens. So moving beyond just job descriptions to understanding the work and the tasks that are at hand. And when you understand the work and the tasks, you can start to get at the skills. And when you understand the skills, you can start to look at adjacencies and capability. And that also opens up opportunity for DE&I to open up the, um, the audience for consideration um, and inclusion. Um, it also creates the opportunity to look at people's experience with work. So it's not just what is their experience at work or what tools do they have to get their job done? It's what skills are they able to develop in your organization? And how well do you know what skills they have to offer to your organization? And how well are you aligning the skills you need to move forward with your business strategy with the skills that person's looking to develop in their career? And all of this is coming together at a very unique time in the world, which is what is driving business transformation and talent transformation and HR transformation kind of all at the same time. So I think this is why uh, folks like myself and, and Anthony find ourselves on, on these uh, webinars and on these conversations so much um, because this truly is, you know, a, a skill evolution or a revolution or as Rebecca referred to it. Um, and we are designing work for the future. Um, Anthony, it looks like um, we lost Rebecca. And I know, I know Gail has been very, very uh, valiantly trying to join in from a technical perspective and, and hasn't been able to. I think part of this is, you know, you talked about adoption and I, mm -hmm. I talked a little bit about how, how this is driving change and being done differently. A key part of this is it's not just technology and it's not just process. A big part of this is also cultural change, right? Mm -hmm. How you how you lead differently, how you manage differently, how you communicate differently. When you talk about what this has meant for your organization internally, but also what it's meant for the clients that you're working with, can you talk about how you've seen various approaches to driving this internal advocacy and this cultural change? Yeah, look, I think I think it's um, and we are doing a good job, aren't we, Jason, in uh, in making this a, a two way conversation. So uh, it's uh, it, it's fortunate we've had lots of fun talking about this in the past. So I think I think the first thing in terms of advocacy is what we're seeing and what we saw on our own journey and what we're seeing with clients is 
that you know you really need to start with a very strong business case mm -hmm. around how you're going to change um and that needs to be smart but differentiated because you know chros including our own trent is under a lot of pressure to be able to drive change quite quickly so that advocacy i think starts at the kind of macro level right at the top um you know ceo is putting a lot of pressure on to be able to drive ai so um you know it, it, the cultural change around that is quite significant from a coo perspective there's a real a lot of pressure around cost and productivity and from the cio perspective i think there is some nervousness in this shift around you know how do i make my current architecture and current in investments work with this you know this skills and ai shift so you know the the, the revolution that's 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 happening now um comes with some very differentiated business cases that are needed and then in terms of how it this is actually landing from an ey perspective i think you know we we've been um very much focused on trying to uh, do three things right from what I mentioned earlier being human centric. First of all, it's not just about creating a great experience, although that's critical. It's actually about how you infuse that experience into the places that the people, you know, use use skills. So for for us, this is about how do we not only provide a really engaging kind of new process and, and new um, career structure, you know, powered by the AI, and there is some amazing magic in the AI, being able to have those profiles, you know, automated and constantly updated. Now we've got good adoption levels. There is some magic there, but that's not enough. In order to really drive a different experience and in a sustainable experience, we have found we've had to really uh, have a multi-channel approach. So we're now looking at how we, for example, bring that uh, employee experience into, you know, our Teams platform. So how we use that within um, our, uh, you know, app point of work, because this is where our people actually want to experience, um, you know, careers, want to experience their growth and learning journeys. And so we're looking at how we can drive that um, for our people. And, you know, that goes with the, the fact that about 70% of people in EY, um, uh, they want chat to be the primary channel. So this combination of Gen AI um, and uh, skill, a skills-based approach really is driving, I think, a huge opportunity there. And then more broadly, I mentioned it earlier, uh, you know, ownership here and giving control to our people, at least from a talent marketplace perspective, is really key. Because what we found is in order to, uh, you know, actually have that experience sustained, and to drive that good levels of adoption, we needed to be able to give control over those profiles to our people. So, you know, being able to actually see where the data is actually coming from so that you can choose effectively how you want to show up in the EY world. This is something that's been really critical for us and for our clients. So there's some subtle shifts, I guess, Jason, in terms of how we've used that strategy uh, at EY. And I see that Gail's joined us. So. Welcome, Gail. Yeah, Gail, Gail, I'm not sure when you joined, but I was giving you credit for valiantly trying to fight the technical difficulties and yeah. so glad you made it through. Um, so for everyone who's uh, in the audience, uh, Gail is uh, the uh, uh, HR lab director for Forvia, and I want to give him a few minutes to introduce himself, uh, but I want to also give him a chance to answer this question because Forvia has been on a journey in their own skills-based transformation. Um, and they've also um, started to see the other side of the impact this can have, as well as some recognition for their efforts. So Gail, take a few minutes just to introduce yourself to the audience, but you're joining the conversation right when we're talking about kind of gaining um, the kind of the cultural uh, shift and the internal um, kind of change that is, is required to, to make this shift. Yeah. Hi everyone, and 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 sorry for being late. Uh, indeed, some technical issues that I have to fix. So my name is Gail. Indeed, I'm a HR lab director uh, at Forvia. Mm -hmm. So Forvia, uh, we are a global uh, company. We are in the uh, automotive industry, uh, one of the largest supplier uh, for uh, OEMs, operating in the 40 uh, countries. 
and uh, basically I would say you know we are the we are uh, uh, present our products and solutions are, are uh, equipping one vehicle uh, in two uh, globally so big company 157,000 people globally 25 uh, billions of uh, euros turnover and um, we've decided to enter these uh, AI uh, uh, challenges two, two three years ago you know back when our CEOs uh, requested you know us to think about how AI would change you know the way we approach we the way we develop the way we attract the way we uh, 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 help our uh, people, you know, move uh, in the company. And uh, indeed, you know, in that period, we we did lots of uh, research. We met lots of uh, consultants, startups, and so on. And uh, we came to the conclusion that we uh, actually were able to leverage the, the power of um, predictive matching uh, in the field of uh, talent acquisition and talent management. And we had this feeling that indeed, you know, we had something big and we've decided you know to uh, start with to go with eightfold which uh, felt you know uh, to be the the, the most relevant uh, uh, partner to work with uh, to work with us so uh, back to uh, your question i would say that um, um, you know when you are facing any kind of transformation is uh, uh, HR is are, 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 are here, you know, to uh, um, to welcome, to foster, to educate, uh, because everything is about education, and to uh, to bridge, uh, to act as a bridge between the, the our business objectives, our own business transformation, and our uh, employees' uh, development. Uh, so I would say that part of our challenge is a business challenge, all right? Because we are not talking about a, a technological or a, a project for us. It's really a business transformation that we are trying to do with with AI, and every, everything is about business. So we are not talking about uh, uh, something else that you have to get prepared, you know, for our future. So our uh, uh, mission is very uh, mi critical. Critical mission is just to uh, help people to understand where are we going and how are we going to help you, to develop you, to make you uh, moving from uh, step A to uh, B. Um, so I think we are a couple of uh, of priorities as a, as HR. Um, in our case, part of it is about education and cultural transformations. Uh, we have acquired a big company a couple of years uh, ago, and uh, when you try, you know, to build one single company, uh, it's very, very, very important to educate people and explain how um, we'll be able, thanks to AI, thanks to a more, more skills-based organization, we'll be able to integrate people, to uh, share common culture and uh, to uh, help people, you know, understanding what's going to be their future, uh, because they'll be able, you know, to project themselves uh, in in uh, in uh, in uh, yeah with more with more clarity. Um, second priority, I think, for us, it's about uh, people engagement. Um, you know, part of our uh, journey is about how you engage people, you know, to keep with us in the in the future. So with uh, uh, these features, you know, that will help us to empower the people, uh, I think we'll be able, you know, to propose again, you know, um, a smart uh, anticipation of what's going to be the future and uh, recognition, you know, of, uh, uh, of our people. And um, um, back to, uh, back to uh, the question of change management, um, you know, our mission is as well to share recognition, to share results, to emphasize of, of what works and the, uh, the, uh, the journey that we have accomplished and uh, for the last years. And uh, in this per perspective, I would say that it's, uh, it's uh, amazing, you know, the change that we did over the last uh, two, three years. Um, we are, I would say we are a bit lucky in our, in our business because uh, we are moving from a, a two a maker to a more tech company. So we have a journey. And um, in our business, you know, most of, I would say 80%, you know, of our jobs are, let's say, standard. Okay, so 
uh, were able you know to standardize uh, uh, very very quick uh, and at scale most of our uh, most of our workforce so this is uh, something that is critical and uh, and again I, I would say that everything starts with education and sharing again you know the sharing our uh, accomplishments no i think that's great and again you talked about a lot of good things there you talked about um the need to think beyond just an initiative for hr by hr right and aligning with the business and also communicating what this means for how all the actions for employees ultimately tie into where the business is going um, and then about how this drives change or ultimately for the organization and for the for the culture. Um, Anthony, if you're able to turn your camera back on and join us, I want to ask uh, the next question back to you. Um, Anthony, are you able to join? Yes. Um, so yeah. one of the things that often comes up as or organizations are considering this journey is, you know, when we think about employee experience and we think about the way people get their job done, they're often doing it with a myriad of tools. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people are trying to figure out how do we just make sure that this isn't just another tool and we're not throwing yet another place for them to go. Um, and, you know, are, are we oversaturating how people spend their time? And are we trying to direct them into yet another portal to, to duplicate efforts? When you talked about earlier around adoption, you know, how, how is this different and how do you kind of communicate and drive change like this to make sure you get buy-in? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, Jason. And I think having been in the role of digital talent leader at EY, owning all of our platforms for 400,000 people, um, obviously just adding in more, um, you know, sweets on the sweet trolley, um, you know, isn't going to be helpful from an employee experience perspective. But I think this is where AI does play a really significant role. And I, I suppose I'm bound to say that given, um, given the, uh, the, 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 you know, the capability on the call today. But I really do in my 25 plus years helping organizations pull the lever around digital, I really do think AI is changing the game in this area in terms of experience. And the reason I say that is that, you know, EY has, like many organizations, um, you know, invested in its cloud-based platforms. It's got that, you know, let's say structured data right um, or on the way to being right, um, but hasn't necessarily actually uh, realized the value from an experience perspective. And, and this is common um, I find with our clients as well, whereby those investments haven't necessarily led to a, a, a you know a great experience in inverted commas. And the reason for that is you know there's many reasons for it, but the, the top couple of reasons are, and you know employees want to see um, how they are going to grow, develop, you know navigate their careers, navigate their lives in their organisations and outside, you know with a simple 360 view of how are they going to, you know, drive a better learning experience in their careers? How are they going to get find the right coaches in the business in EY that's from 400,000 people? How do you do that? How do you get attached to the right projects? How do you do the right projects? How do you actually find the right via recruitment roles, et cetera? And the reality is that our cloud-based platforms do that in you know um if you like chunks really nicely but how that appears to the employee is very disparate so this is where i think the power of ai and i, I know jason you do this much better than me but the power of the data there and that ability to look at both structured and unstructured data in our case it's actually only three platforms that we found that were valuable for our people that was our core hr platform our learning platform and in fact, SharePoint, the combination of that using AI was able to surface a completely different experience. And so what we've tried to do, and this is something that we're helping a lot of clients with now, is actually get the value of their investments in cloud uh, through AI and creating that simple, but then 360 view for an employee around how you navigate um, 
you know, uh, your career and the way that you, you you effectively go through your career in EY or any or any client. And that's the first thing. And the second thing I'd say is that what we found and what I'm finding with a lot of clients is that this then forces the question, what is your digital tra channel strategy for your people? And so, you know, helping organizations at the moment from life sciences all the way through to manufacturing across to mining and resources, there's a common thread, which is, you know, it's not about finding one way to engage. There is no simple answer that just says you have an experienced platform and lo and behold, everything is perfect. The reality is you need to look at the data about how your people are going to use those platforms. And for us in EY and for many organizations, that means you need a bit of a channel strategy. You need to look at that channel strategy and being future proofed because how I use, um, let's say a traditional portal type approach um, with a bit of salt and pepper hair being in my uh, 50s versus the majority of, uh, of our people and our clients people is different. And that's why I mentioned earlier, okay. embedding that into your strategy around how you're going to use chat, how you're going to be able to create that experience irrespective of where your people are is really, really critical. So Jason, I think it's a difficult one because the CIO is trying to cut down on systems, but actually where I'm seeing the value here is leveraging those platforms for a unified experience and then thinking about a new channel strategy based on that. And I think this speaks to kind of the dynamic nature of an AI system versus the static nature of a system of record is that the uh, town intelligence is often described as a win-win in that you know every time you're in the system as it's gathering data the more it learns it's dynamically updating so there's always something new to see there's always something new to learn and that also helps drive adoption right it's not just that if you're in the system today there's something new to learn tomorrow it's that if you're in the system this morning there's something new you know in, in 10 minutes in in a half an hour this afternoon from other users and this continually drives people going back in the system because there's something in it for them as it continually learns. And the more it helps inform employees, it's also informing the organization and the two sides come together in a dynamic marketplace. Hey, Gail, I wanna throw it over to you to say, how do you then take this information and communicate this kind of adoption and success as you're rolling this out to leadership? Yeah. Basically, I would say that, you know, in our business, in our industry, we are very pragmatic guys, all right? So we do not oversell, we do not sell about a concept. We talk about, you know, concrete, super concrete and pragmatic examples. So what we did first, you know, is to, to um, you know, share, you know, our first uh, year result with our uh, executive committee, super pragmatic. Again, we have a strong KPI that we shared, the volume of traffic on our career site, that are uh, multiplied by more than four. The application hub, uh, as you as you said, indeed, the lesson learned because indeed you know we are still in, in the learning curve and every day we are learning new things, new channel. The way indeed as well it moved a bit our sourcing strategy, the productivity gain that we did. So everything that is very pragmatic and the KPIs of regular you know I would say recruitment and uh, talent management activities, the savings and so on. This was, you know, for the executive committee, and we shared as well uh, the kind of uh, HR awards that we have uh, uh, won over the last uh, the last months. Then, of course, we had to communicate our uh, results and to engage, you know, the entire HR community, and we did it through global HR um, uh, live presentation, you know, to share country by country, you know, everything that's, that's, that's has been done, you know, the benchmark again competition as well to demonstrate, you know, that indeed in our industry we are far, far, far uh, uh, away uh, in advance, you know, compared to competition. Um, again, in our countries we have uh, selected, uh, we have identified, you know, some champion. So we gamified a bit, you know, the deployment and we have awarded, we have uh, delivered, you know, uh, recognitions to, you know, make them proud of belonging to this uh, big transformation because indeed it's a deep transformation that we want to ensure within the within the company and um and so two other things next uh, is all employees because we want to engage all employees in this transformation so we did lots of com communications through social media networks through linkedin through our own uh, intranet 
uh, we have, you know, empower people, you know, from the business as well, you know, to demonstrate, you know, thanks to the system, how, uh, what, they, what they gain actually in terms of uh, new opportunities in the company uh, to grow, develop sure. themselves. And, uh, and looking ahead, because we are still in the learning curve and we know that we have to again to gain into maturity, um, we are part of the global transformation team uh, who think about what's going to be the future of our industry and our company, thanks to uh, uh, generative AI, you know, and the impact of AI on the on the HR function, and uh, and and indeed we are thinking about you know how to deploy you know these copilot features you know uh, internally and externally uh, to again you know attract, develop engage our employees. So we are sharing this with the executive committee step by step. We have quarterly meetings with them. And um, again, it's still a learning curve. So we don't know exactly what's going to be the future. But we know that indeed, you know, yes, uh, it will have lots of uh, uh, amazing impact that we want to infuse in the, in the team. Hey, Gail, we only have a few minutes left for the folks that are here that are just starting out on this journey or aren't as far on this road as you are. If you were to share just one piece of advice as a takeaway, what would it be? Um, I would say the very, f what we did again, you know, we, we decided to go step by step, but we decided as well, you know, to uh, think big. What I mean by think big, it's think big from day one. So when we've decided to deploy a talent acquisition, for instance, we've decided, you know, to go uh, as big bang, all right. So we just decided not to do pilot and so on. We wanted, you know, to start very fast because we had a lots of business uh, issues, and we wanted, you know, to attract people. So think big, but you know, in parallel, in the same time, be pragmatic, all right. There's no, there's no uh, common recipe, you know. I think it's you, you have to start. You you will probably do lots of mistakes as we did. We've decided, you know, we did lots of benchmark and so on. And actually, you know, what we've discovered is that we, we had good people that need as well, you know, to be uh, engaged. Uh, so what I want to tell you as well is engage, engage, and engage. Move step by step, be pragmatic, and engage your people. Uh, actually, I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing journey. And even, you know, if people are a bit afraid, I think this is a journey for, for them as well in order to gain in terms of employability and uh, uh, to being able, you know, to draw their, their own job. So think big, be pragmatic, engage, and clean your data. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, across all of your engagements, any any uh, words of advice to summarize in a nice, short and sweet statement? Well, I actually couldn't have organized it better in as much as Gail, I totally agree. My big one was uh, think big, but go deep. And I think in line with what Gail said there, it's, it's, it's so exciting, the opportunity here for us um, in, in our roles to really change the way that we do business. But I would say, think big, go, go deep. And that means make sure you've got a plan, make sure you've got a roadmap and recognize that this, you know, your first steps will be the start, not the end of the process. I love it. I couldn't agree more. Um, when I was an analyst and I was advising organizations going through this change, I would always say you can break it up into chunks, but you should always build with the end in mind, right? So you should always have a plan of where you're trying to go. You don't have to try to do it all at once, but as you're taking that step, you should have an idea of where you're trying to end up, right? So I appreciate those words of advice. Hopefully everyone found something helpful uh, from the conversation today. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, we appreciate Rebecca uh, for joining us and for starting us off. Um, she was able to listen in for the second half of the conversation, but unfortunately, she had to drop off. We appreciate Gail for figuring out and troubleshooting for able to join us uh, for two thirds of the call and for being able to share those words of advice. Uh, the Forvia team has been on an incredible journey as has the Ernst & Young team. So thank you so much. And for everyone who attended, um, we will follow up with the questions that were submitted through the chat. Um, and as mentioned at the top of the call, um, through the On24 platform, there's also information for our upcoming Cultivate events. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you so much.